So we're going to move on to the first panel. And the first panel is about the healing power of now using presence as a therapeutic tool. So I ask the panelists to wend their way up here, please. So the purpose is to explore what it means to be truly present with a seriously ill person. We'll explore the practical applications of some teachings of presence and mindfulness to the practice of palliative care. ask the panelists to each introduce themselves because I'll muck it up. <laughs> well, that's a challenge. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Patty Mouton. Um, I hail from right here in Orange County, and my day job is serving as vice president at Alzheimer's Orange County, and I have the pleasure to work with Dr. Vincent Nguyen on the Orange County Post Coalition, the Advanced Care Planning Partners. And good morning, my name is Vincent Nguyen and I have the privilege of working here in Orange County and um, working at Hogue Hospital as the palliative medicine director. And I also work for Patty um, in, in advancing advanced care planning in our community. I'm glad to be up here with all of you. My name's Lydia Richards. I am a former hospice chaplain. I have moved into, um, have, I have my own business. I do mindfulness-based leadership development, which actually it's a lot like hospice chaplaincy, but in the corporate setting now. Oh, and I was chaplain under Jim McGregor, and I survived many years. I think she deserves a round of applause, actually. <laughs> Of course, I'm Jim McGregor, and uh, I don't think I'll say anything more. <laughs> because I've said more than enough in the last day and a half. So what we're going to do, first of all, is start out with a basic mindfulness 101. And then we will each take a couple of minutes to discuss how in practical purposes, mindfulness has helped in situations that we've been in. And then we have a case that we're going to discuss. So given the crowd here, I know that many of you, maybe most of you, are quite familiar with mindfulness and practicing presence. There might be some who are still sort of wondering what it's about. So we offer this very short overview of mindfulness, what it is, what its benefits are, how to go about doing it. I am going to cite a bunch of studies. I'm not going to stop to reference them here, but they are in the material related to this session. The mind is like a snow globe. When it's agitated, it's really hard to see anything clearly. But if you set it down and let it rest, the mind becomes settled and everything becomes more clear. One way to do that, to settle the mind, is by intentionally cultivating mindfulness. <clears throat> Now, the definitions of mindfulness vary a bit, but there's a lot more agreement than there is disagreement about it. For our purposes today, we'll be using Eckhart Tolle's words. Mindfulness is observing and accepting what is happening inside you and around you as it's happening. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? It may be simple, it's a simple idea anyway, but it is not easy. Cultivating mindfulness, I think, is challenging for two important reasons. 
One, our minds wander. One of the studies, it's, it's an amazing statistic to me, um, the, the, on average, our minds are not present 49% of the time. And Jim thinks that's probably low. I think he's probably right. Mostly our minds wander. We are not present to where we are. It's been said for thousands of years that the mind is like a drunken monkey jumping from tree to tree. And mostly, our monkey minds jump around a lot. They jump to the past, to ruminating or rehashing or reminiscing. They jump to the future, planning, anticipating, hoping, worrying. Mostly we're not here. We're either in the past or in the future. You might be at a patient's bedside, trying to pay attention and focus on the story she is telling you about her sister's cat. But your mind is at the last IDT meeting, or the next patient visit, or Mr. Jones' pain that you haven't managed to get under control yet. Or you might be on your living room floor playing Legos with your daughter, and your mind is jumping all over your to-do list. We cultivate mindfulness by developing a disciplined mind, able to focus on one thing at a time. Now, while that kind of sounds like a bummer, if you'd have like a disciplined mind, that doesn't sound like a lot of fun. But <laughs> there's a great article in this stuff that, that you can receive online about this. It's called, A Wandering Mind is an Unhappy Mind. And they look at happiness levels of people who are present and not present. And it's true. Even though it's a discipline, the more we are able to focus on one thing at a time, the happier we are. So the first reason it's hard to cultivate mindfulness is that our minds wander. The second is that it's not just about paying attention. It's about paying attention in a particular way. Now, imagine that you are a cat burglar, and you're just about to, to do a big heist. Well, you would be very present. You would hear every creak, and you would notice every movement. But that's not mindfulness. We're talking about a different kind of present moment awareness. Mindfulness, as I said, is observing and accepting what's happening inside you and around you. We cultivate the habit of accepting life, the moment, exactly the way it is. We cultivate the habit of not judging our own feelings or thoughts, not judging what's happening around us, not trying to grab on and make things last or push them away and reject them. We don't have to like it, but with mindfulness, we take a big breath. and accept what is. After all, it already is. So mindfulness is observing and accepting what's happening inside us and around us. So you notice that is not at all a religious description. While well, many traditions have contributed mightily to the conversation of mindfulness, particularly, especially Buddhism, for our purposes, and for the research we cite, it's entirely secular. Now, the benefits, crazy benefits. And then I'll go on to how one goes about doing it. So, likely you have seen the hype. Uh, there's a big buzz all around mindfulness as you go down the supermarket checkout line. You can see the fancy magazines all about mindfulness. According to them, mindfulness will make you happy, it will help you win the lottery, and it will, re and it will reduce your belly fat. 
There is so much garbage out there on the topic. Thankfully, in recent years, there's also a growing body of evidence-based research on the real benefits of mindfulness. One of the most significant contributors to the field, to mindfulness research in the US, is John Kabat-Zinn. He started mindfulness-based stress reduction, and I'm sure many of you are well acquainted with his work. He, it was 40 years ago he started it. Today, mindfulness-based stress reduction is available at 1,000 medical centers in 30 countries. It's an eight-week program that teaches mindfulness and body awareness. Now, initially, John Kabat-Zinn started this just to address chronic pain. But now, through his work and his research, people enroll in his program for lots of reasons largely because of the work of John Kabat-Zinn and other pioneers, today we, we do have solid data on the benefits of mindfulness. They include pain management, stress reduction, improvements in ADHD, anxiety, depression, stress, fatigue, anger, headaches, high blood pressure, and sleep disorders. And I'm still keeping my fingers crossed when it comes to belly fat. It just might happen. Yeah, right on. We're only really beginning to understand the far-reaching benefits of mindfulness when it comes to quality of life. My work today focuses on mindfulness in the corporate setting. I teach mindfulness to managers supervisors, and corporate leaders. Now, while admittedly this is anecdotal, I see every day the power of mindfulness to transform communication, to improve relationships. I see its effectiveness in reversing chronic overwhelm, that's amazing, and relieving stressed out lives without changing anything else about their work. It comes back to this, to the clarity that we have when our mind is naturally settled. So how do you do it? Well, there's actually a big debate going on these days. Do you have to meditate to become more mindful? And I, I come down on no, you don't. But if you want to get on the fast track, and I know that's an oxymoron, speedy mindfulness. <laughs> but if you want to become significantly more mindful soon, then you probably will need to meditate on a regular basis. So how do you do that? Well, first, you stop. You unplug everything that rings and buzzes and beeps, and you get quiet. You focus your attention on one thing. One thing that's here now, not one thing like yesterday or tomorrow. On one thing. Maybe your breath, maybe the sounds. It doesn't even really matter what you focus on. The point is to begin to train your mind to focus and to stay there. And of course, once you try to do that, it doesn't sound that hard until you actually try to do it. And then when you do, your monkey's like ah, da, da, all over the place. So then we go to the accepting, observe and accept what goes on. So we accept and not judge ourselves because our monkey's jumping around. You don't say to yourself, oh, I suck at meditation. <laughs> Just gently and lovingly return your focus to that one thing again and again, and again. Now, in full disclosure, meditation is dose-dependent. The more you do it, the more mindful you will become. But I do have good news. You don't have to meditate for hours a day. You don't have to move to the Far East or become a monk. Studies have shown that in as little as five minutes a day, you can realize significant, measurable improvements in your overall well-being. I think that's pretty amazing. In closing, 
We saw yesterday morning one powerful example of what it's like to become mindful. When Charles showed the video, the last video, or near the end, there was a, a clip of a doctor who had walked with his, his wife through her dying. Before, he was not mindful. And afterwards, I thought it was a beautiful description of what it's like to be a mindful physician. To work to be fully present for each of the interactions with other people. Just beautiful. So with that now, we will go on to, back to the panel and talk about mindfulness specifically as it relates to palliative medicine. Thank you, Lydia. So um, we're each going to take a moment to say something about how mindfulness or being present has helped us. And um, I might as well start. I have the microphone. So I was, uh, I went in to see a patient one day in the patient's room and uh, was talking to the patient and my mind was, I don't know where, but it sure wasn't where we were. And things were going to in a handbasket. And I, th I thought, this is, wow, this isn't fair for this patient. So I stopped and I said, would you excuse me for a minute? I'll, be, I'll come back, but I need to leave the room. And I left the room and I gathered myself. And I went back in and started all over again, as if we hadn't even talked. And I was present for the patient and things went obviously much better. And the patient at the end said, thank you for doing that. So that, just that little thing, recognizing in the moment that it was going off the rails and the only reason it was going off the rails was because of me, is a huge thing. And so because of that, I, when I would teach other people about going to see patients, I, I tell them, you need to ask yourself two important questions before you go in with the patient. And these two important questions are, how can I love? How can I serve? Well, Jim shared a success story. I'll share, I'll share a rip-roaring failure with you. I was, and I'm sure we all have these stories. Every one of us could tell the stories of when we were mindful and it worked and when we weren't mindful and it didn't. My, my big awakening was visiting a young African-American woman in a New York City hospital hospice. And she and I had a beautiful connection. At the time, my brother was traveling in the Far East and he usually called once a week and we hadn't heard from him for almost three weeks. So that's the backdrop to this. I was having this beautiful connection with this woman who had been in the hospital a long time and she said at one point, her family doesn't come to see her. And I said, they're far away? And she said, yes, they live in Brooklyn. Uh, okay. And then she said, and my brother, I don't even think he's alive anymore. I don't know where he is. The next thing out of my mouth was, wow, you have quite a collection of crackers there, don't you? And about five minutes later, I was out of the room. The whole thing had just dropped, like in the toilet, in a second. And I realized only after I left the room, actually, I, I didn't realize for days, what had happened was I was too scared and her brother was my brother. And had I been more mindful, I would have realized that her brother is not my brother. My brother is in the Far East and she doesn't know where her brother is. And now I, I, I did learn to actually have that conversation with myself. Her baby is not my baby. His mother is not my mother. Um, and that, for me, helps me become more mindful. In, in the work that I did in chaplaincy and the work that I do in the corporation now, The hallmark of palliative care has always been since its inception is to um, be attentive to the psychosocial, emotional, and spiritual, as well as the physical need of the person. And we hear this quite often. 
And we have this mantra for most of us, or for all of us in this room perhaps, it's about the patient. It's not about us, it's about the patient. It's the mantra that we repeat to ourselves over and over and over and over again. However, throughout the day, it's not that easy. When we're covering a service of a very busy inpatient and have an outpatient services in which the people are waiting three to four weeks to see you, and phone calls, and you're going in for our family meetings, and how do you find calmness in a sea of chaos? And one of the things that has helped me has been calmness. And that basically means when I inhale, when I inspire, I inspire calmness. And when I exhale, I smile. That's what I do throughout the day when people are, are coming, Dr. Dan, can you do this? I say, oh, yes, I'm going to smile. Inhale calmness and just absorb it in and just smile. And not be just a, be a grin idiot, but more like this, like this, <laughs> I'm going to do my best. But if you can also imagine when we go and sit at the patient's bedside, when the patients are in turmoil and you listen to their story, you know, how do we become open-hearted and sensitive and while in our own mind we're thinking, why am I going to respond to this patient and a monkey just bouncing all over the place? And it doesn't help for someone like me with a little bit of a de attention deficit disorder. And, and uh, that's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Um, <laughs> but how do you find that monkey, kind of calm it down, and you're listening to the patients crying and sobbing and they're going frantic upon us. So I apply the same thing. I sit there, I hold the patient's hand. And I said, let's just close our eyes for a bit and let's inspire calmness. Let's inspire the love. Let's inspire the lucky we are. And you can't imagine how can I be lucky when I'm dying and I'm suffering, having pain. But let's see if we can discover the beauty of our, in our suffering. And then we exhale. Let's exhale calmness. And let's exhale with a smile. And we know that studies have shown that we spend more work and energy when we frown and grimace. But we're so much more calm when we smile because it reflects our inner being. And so how are we, as palliative care, palliative medicine, deliverer to these patients and family, how do we bring that peace with our presence? And so that's how I approach this in a very chaotic day. And sometimes when I hang around my friends and, and have thoughts of many, many things I want to talk about, and these are the kind of things that help me. Those of you who know me um, know that I'm not traditionally mindful. I'm kind of accidentally mindful in a lot of ways. <coughs> if you um, are at all familiar with Christian scripture, there's a story of two sisters, Martha and Mary. And Martha, I self-identify with. She's busy. She gets things done. She's task-oriented. She had a to-do list, like you wouldn't believe, fold those tents, feed the throngs, you catch the fish, whatever needed to be done, Martha had it in hand. And believe me, those tents were folded crisply. Her sister, on the other hand, was sort of gentle and sat at the feet of the teacher and listened and took it all in. And I think Martha probably thought Mary was a slacker. But the teacher said, Martha, chill out. <laughs> Look at what Mary's doing. She's listening. She is observing. She is in the moment with the messaging. And so I, I try and be more Mary, even though I'm genetically predisposed to be Martha. As I did my homework for this, <clears throat> I, I wanted to bring in cultural things, too, because mindfulness can be very culturally disparate. Um, I happen to be Irish. I know it's hard to imagine. I sort of look like the map of Killarney. But there's a concept in Irish culture and Celtic spirituality that predates the Roman invasion, St. Patrick, leprechauns, and even Guinness. <laughs> and that's the concept of being fey. And Webster's gives a modern definition of this as an intense state of mind which often presages 
one's death or another's death. Common parlance and vernacular refers to it as people that have premonitions to which we should pay attention. And I think that whole notion of paying attention to one's premonitions, paying attention to what's going on right now, we might be presaging something really important, and if we don't stop and pay attention to it, we'll miss it altogether. The tense may be folded, but we'll miss the important messaging. We were asked to connect this to some um, real-time experiences, so I have two that I want to share if I have time. Um, I've done some work in um, pastoral care in the hospital, and I was always really excited about it, and I'm going to go pray these people. And um, I bring Holy Communion, because I also happen to be Catholic, and there was one lady, and she was really cantankerous and kind of mean, and um, her chart said Roman Catholic and that she wanted Holy Eucharist. And so I'm like, well, I'm here to give you communion, darn it. And <clears throat> she was just not very receptive. And finally, I realized that there was a vent, and she was dying, actively dying, but conscious and fairly coherent. And there was a vent right above her bed that was blowing right on her face. And she said, and she had some expletives for me. She probably had been a sailor at one point. Um, <laughs> she said, I don't know what the hell you want to do with me. Unless somebody gets that vent from blowing right in my face, there's, I don't want to talk to you about anything. I've talked to the nurses, they, you know, you, you probably have all met this woman. So being a Martha, it's like, I'm going to solve this problem. And trying to be Mary, I thought, I'm going to try and make it as prayerful as I can, because boy, is she difficult, and wow. So I just found a stepladder. And I'm sure it was against all OSHA rules and probably all HR rules and whatever. But I climbed up, and I was able to force the vent closed. And in my career of 20 years of dealing with older adults and end-of-life care, um, that was the holiest moment. Because then she could be mindful. She could now take a deep breath without that thing blowing in her face. And when I gave her Holy Communion, it was probably one of the best connections with another human being that I could ever have experienced. And had I not paid attention, understood the surroundings, observed, but taken appropriate action to get us back to that place where her monkeys weren't jumping about. And the second one is, is a little more um, close to home for many of us. Um, it was one of my very, very first hospice patients as a volunteer. And the chart note said, you shouldn't even bother going, but the family's requested a visit. She's non-responsive, non-verbal, late-stage Alzheimer's disease, 24-hour sitter, um, and, you know, but go and chart that you did it so we can tell the family. And I went, Oh, that doesn't sound very nice. So I went in there, and those of you who know me also know that I can just talk like a magpie nonstop, especially if it's filling the void, because I'm a Martha and not naturally a Mary. And I'm talking to her, and she was lovely, and she had a very North American, Anglo-Saxon kind of last name, like Wellington or something like that. And her white hair was all done up, and she had on a pink satin bed jacket. It was adorable. And she wasn't non-responsive because her eyes were watching me and kind of twinkling a little bit, but um, no verbal response and no um, acknowledgement of anything I was actually saying. Well, I looked around the room. I had paid attention in training class. And I saw a photograph of a little tiny bride in a beautiful long lace veil standing next to an American officer with the blue pants with the stripe down the side and the white gloves and he gold buttons 
standing there, and in the background of the photo was an animal, a llama. Where do llamas live? Peru and Ecuador. She had apparently married an American serviceman, and her native language was not English. But for 65 years, she'd been in this country, and she'd been speaking only English. Everybody forgot that her native tongue was Spanish. And so she was nonverbal and nonresponsive because she had forgotten her English as a result of the Alzheimer's. So in my fluent, mellifluous 10th grade Spanish, <laughs> I said, ¿Cómo está usted, señora? And her eyes softened, and she said, OK. That is mindful connection. And I was glad that I had paid attention in training class, that I hadn't been on my phone or taken other notes. But it brought me back to, now I can talk to her, even though I only know 12 words of Spanish. <laughs> so there are practical ways to incorporate this really wonderful notion of quieting our minds. And I think there's ways that you can marry the task-oriented side of ourselves with this mindfulness and this opportunity and desire to make gentle mental connections with people. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to I'm going to uh, we're going to discuss a case uh, briefly, and uh, because uh, Lydia said we only need five minutes of meditation a day, we're going to do an exercise at the end to help us all on the road to doing that every day. So Sam is a 76-year-old man with non-small cell lung cancer. He's a widower. He lives alone. He has two daughters. He is estranged from one, and she lives in a different town. He has problems with recurrent malignant effusions, has a pleurex catheter, which is drained every three days. He's been offered hospice, but due to family pressure, he's seeking more aggressive treatment. He, his other illnesses include cirrhosis related to um, his drinking habits, and heart disease. His chest pain related to his disease and his tube placement. He has nausea related to the chemotherapy, which he is still getting. He's always been a tough guy. He's a veteran. He rode motorcycles, which he's been unable to do. He feels like a failure because he isn't beating his cancer. He had a strong connection with his wife, who died a couple of years ago. He's fearful that he'll become an invalid and become dependent on his daughter, with whom he's close. His estranged daughter wants to visit him, but he doesn't want to have anything to do with her. She wants to make amends and heal the relationship. He is not there for her and not open to that. His daughter in town has teenage daughters who, um, if you've had teenage daughters, they can be a handful, and they are living up to that. Stephanie, looking after her father and managing these teenage daughters, feels overwhelmed. She can't imagine how she can care for her father. She's worried about how long is this going to go on? How will the finances last? All of those things. Her time spent with her father is filled with worries about the future, her ability to help him, and of course her daughters. The nurse visiting Sam feels impotent. Everything she suggests to help his pain, he refuses. Refuses. He doesn't want drugs. He should be able to handle this. After all, he is a veteran and a tough guy and a motorcycle rider. Pain medicine is for weaklings. She can see in his expression and body language that he is suffering on many levels. She's becoming more and more discouraged to the point that she even wonders why should I go and visit him. Would he be better served by another nurse? So I'm going to ask the panelists how they think mindfulness might help in this situation. No, I'm going to let you guys start. I'm passing the buck. I'll tackle this one. Um, not an easy case for sure, and this is where calmness and listening comes in. And um, I think there's a difference, not there, I think, but there's a difference between hearing and listening. Hearing is with our ears and listening to what is said and unsaid. And, and, um, and as we listen through the story of a man who's very 
ill, um, but, refu but refuses to give up, but yet at the same time has issues in which he has not resolved. So, so I think being mindfulness means let's start where the patient's at. Start where they're at and ask about what their understanding of their situation. Um, we just can't assume with what we have here, but we need to dig a little deeper and get our shovels and get our ears and ready and listen to, and become aware of what the patient is trying to say and clarify what they mean by what he says about, you know, I, I, I'm a tough guy, I don't want pain medicine. We listen to the story in which how he's dealing with his estranged daughter. I mean, are there unresolved conflicts and how to get to the bottom of that and elicit these values without being judgmental. So that's why I would first start is understanding the illness and, and what matters most to him at that time in terms of prioritization. So there's more questions and there are, um, there, there, there's, there's more questions to be asked is what I'm thinking of and, um, and, and go from there. Um, I guess I'm just going to leave that and I want to hear other panelists in here and maybe we can build upon that. I would want to talk to him about his wife and then I'd want to talk to the granddaughters about their notion of grandma. She's been dead for a few years. They're now teenagers. I'm assuming that because Sam was really close and loved his wife and took care of her, she probably was a wonderful grandma to these two teenagers. And perhaps by creating an opportunity to talk about how much we miss grandma, how much we loved her, how wonderful she was in our lives, what kind of a presence she had in the family, then that might open up a way for the granddaughters maybe to connect more with Sam and create some opportunity for loving conversation about a shared positive presence in their lives. And that might then open up some avenues to then talk about the family as a whole, the estrangement, and maybe grandma can somehow be present in the conversation that opens the door to um, the uh, uh, rapprochement with the estranged daughter. Is this on? Yeah. This is really interesting because that I saw totally different things in this. Um, so that the the bringing the wife in. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. So I see a couple of places um, where specifically mindfulness um, might move things along. One is for the nurse. <laughs> we get um, so mindfulness is observing and accepting what's happening within us and outside us, and you can't really get attached to the outcome. Uh, if you do, that's really not mindfulness. So we give our best efforts, and it seems to me that the nurse, when she, feeling impotent, is a, is a judgment about outcome. I'm not having the outcome that I want, so therefore I must be doing something wrong. And uh, a mindful approach might bring the nurse back to him, herself, oh, herself, uh, and be more clear on what she can do, what she is doing, what her wisdom tells her to do, than necessarily what happens on the other side. The other thing that I thought would be interesting would be to explore uh, Sam's understanding of his tough guy-ness. So that's a story he's held about himself probably his whole life. And my personal belief is that our stories uh, mostly cover up who we are, that inside we are pure light. And his tough guy is one of the ways he's coped, probably very useful in his life. And to explore that might, might move him along. Uh, there was one other one. Let me think for a minute. Um, and with, so, so any time that you can get people to talk about what's right here, uh, um, like with the daughter, um, she has an opportunity to uh, learn to be more present. A lot of what we heard about her were her fears, which is, you know, you're projecting the future. 
what is it? Uh, fear is future events appearing real. Um, so she's living in the future a lot, and she might have more lovely moments with her father if you can bring her back to now. Um, uh, Jim and I talked about this. One thing we never do is say anything related to uh, mindfulness. We don't use any Sanskrit words. We, you know, uh, we're very careful not to put people off, especially since they have their own thought traditions and religious traditions. But to simply begin the conversation about well, what's right here, what's what's happening in this, in this moment, um, it's possible that even Sam could learn to be significant. Not learn to. He could experience some mindful moments in, in the process. And to jump in with that. To, to continue where Lydia left off is, you know, as we explore um, where the patient's at, we also explore not only their fears, but also their hopes. Um, you know, what, what are they wishing for? What are they hoping for at this stage? Is there a, is there a, a way of healing that can take place? Um, and, and what I find interesting, though, is sometimes in our, in our intention to bring peace together, when there's when the when the when Sam doesn't want to speak to his wife, I mean to his daughter, how do we make that work? And I think the best way to to do that is to ask for his permission. To say, well, well, maybe perhaps you don't want to talk to your daughter, but may I have the permission to share with her what's going on with you and how we can make this better for you? Um, I, I guess that's the piece of what I, what I would like to explore a little bit as well as we go through this is. Maybe he is a tough guy. Maybe I'm, I'm a military guy. I don't apologize for anybody to anyone. And perhaps this is a way in which we can break that barrier to be that conduit to peace to this um, broken relationship. And, um, and, and, and we, when I think about making peace, I think for people in their own mind, in, in, when they're sick, it's making peace is, is trying to recognize uh, or reconcile what had been and what would or what could be, and how do we bring that together? And I think that's the piece in which, as clinical professionals, as we're there with patients and, and, and be in that moment with them, is, is to see how we can be that conduit. I, I love exploring the, the notion in the family of what has been, what had been, and what is, and what could be, and I think by everybody in the family telling their stories, both daughters, it would be interesting to hear what stories they would tell about their father, and that might give us insight into how he became a tough guy. Was he a tough guy as a dad? I don't think he's a tough guy all the time because he had this real sweetness and caring for his wife. Was he a tough guy when the girls were little? what brought about the estrangement, all these stories of what had been, has been, is now, can get us to what could be. And I think by, by asking people to tell their stories, by asking the teenage girls, you know, they, teenage girls are kind of their own monkeys um, <laughs> on acid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I've raised some, so, so I speak from, I was one. Um, get them to tell some of the stories of when they were little, what had been, because each of, this, each of these trajectories from different perspectives of the family are going to get to some common ground and that might be the core of what could be. And it's going to shed light on what is right now, too. What, what the dynamics are. So, um, I, when I was reading this, and uh, I, I identified with the nurse and that she's doing all these things and nothing's working, and I identified with how, what would be going on in my head and um, as Lydia likes to call it, the crazy roommate in my head would be talking to me incessantly about, you should do that, you're not good enough, all of these things that the crazy roommate in my head uh, 
would be telling me. So how do I quiet the voice of the crazy roommate? And that's, that's, some days that's really hard. And part of what I did with that patient when I went into the room it was my crazy roommate <laughs> was trying to run the... <laughs> trying to run the, the visit. Yeah, yeah and it was, it was crazy. So you, you actually have to, that's why I, asked, I have to ask, how can I love, how can I serve? before you go in, and, um, and that helps somewhat. But then afterwards, I have to look at why, what is it about me that, it, uh, that is making it so important that I make a difference? And is it, is it his goal that I'm meeting or is it my goal or my need to say, see what I did, I helped you. Aren't I wonderful? And so the part of being present there is really whose who's needs am I meeting at the moment? And how do I rein myself in and go, okay, this is where we are. And the other thing that I have used many times in the past is, when, is to, to ask a patient, how are you within yourself? How are you within yourself? I have never had a patient look at me and say, what the heck are you talking about? I've had many sit for what seems like an interminable amount of time because it's probably only been like maybe a minute of silence, but boy, you want to jump in there. But you ask the question, how are you within yourself? And then you just sit and be present and listen for what comes out, because what comes out is going to be what's important. And then you can focus more on really getting to the root of the problem. And it's not about me making you feel better, because <laughs> I know what to do. It's about me finding out what's important for you. How are you within yourself? That brings the piece about, you know, as we sit here, I, I also would like to share, you know, certain buzzwords that we use as we sit and we listen to what patients are saying, utilizing terms such as, such as I, what I'm hearing is, you're telling me this, or what I see in this situation is. So in a way to, to being present means I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying, I'm seeing what you're describing to me. And at the same time, finding the opportunity to say something I wonder if things can be better. I wonder if in this situation we can find a way to make this reconciliation for you. I, I, I fear that, and I also use the word I fear, I fear that if we don't get your pain under control, you know, you, you will be, it will be hard to, to have a, a comfortable life or whatever life you have left, certainly, and I hope that you trust me, that I'm gonna do everything I can to help you and to be present here with you to help guide you in whatever way I can. So those three words we often hear, you know, as part of our communication skills 101 for, for palliative care is the word I wonder, I fear, and I hope. I think that's a, I mean, if, if those are rule of thumbs, I think those are good, good pearls I want to share with you. The other thing that that requires is for you to get in present enough to know what you wonder, what you fear, and what you hope. All right, so um, somebody's been flashing signs at me and I can't see, but something about time. <laughs> hey, colors would be good. We promised you the opportunity to experience um, a guided um, imagery meditation, and uh, so Five minutes. We're going to go ahead and do that now. So we have mindful moments all the time. Anytime you, you see a sunset and you, you know to stop and to take it in. When you're in an argument and you can stop and breathe and see it all more rationally. Now let's see if we can sustain that mindfulness for just a few minutes. So I would invite you to, um, to sit uh, feet flat on the floor 
And if, you, uh, if you're able, um, take, uh, lift your back away from the chair a little bit. Imagine that you have a string gently lifting you up. So to be um, up, as upright as, as is comfortable for you. And we'll just start, before you even close your eyes, just take a few deep breaths. Feel how good it feels to breathe. You breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth. You might notice how the air is cool as you breathe in. And now when you're ready, if you just gently allow your eyes to close if they're not closed already. And allow your breathing to just return to normal, breathing in and out through the nose. And now notice any sounds around you. Sounds that are far away. Sounds that are close by. Maybe very close, like the sound of your neighbor breathing or the sound of my voice. And letting that go now. And just noticing how you're feeling overall right now. How does your body feel? How are your spirits? Now we turn our attention to our breath. Breathing in and out through the nose, just a natural breathing. You don't have to change it at all. We're not thinking about our breathing as much as we're experiencing the sensation of breathing. See if you can stay with that, feeling the sensation of your breathing. And your mind will wander, of course. Just notice that. Be glad. That's a moment of mindfulness when you notice that your mind has wandered. And just gently bring it back, noticing again your breath. If your mind jumps away a hundred times, your job is to bring it back a hundred and one. And now as we bring this to a close, allow a gentle smile to come across your face. Feel what it feels like to smile from the inside. Now, wiggle your fingers and toes a little bit. And when you're ready, allow your eyes to open. So that uh, brings us to the end of this mindfulness panel. I want to thank our panelists for participating and sharing with us very much.